you know, the, the mistake most people make is that you have to quiet the mind. The mind's not going to quiet that way. You can't try to quiet the mind. What you can do is acknowledge the thought that comes in and let it go through its natural path, but don't try to resist it. And little by little, if you don't judge, you will find your groove. I've created a four month course for my pay what you can roots to Samadhi community that I'll be running from August through November. We're going to be deep diving into the practical aspects of how to develop a deep, tangible spiritual connection. Check the description box to learn more. Welcome back. I am here today with somebody who needs no introduction to most of you as he is the (laughs) number one a channel that I see in my your viewers also watch. Alex Ferrari. And he is, as you know, a best selling author, podcaster, speaker, entrepreneur, and filmmaker. And he is, for anyone who doesn't know, the founder of the very popular podcast Next Level Soul. So thank you. Welcome. Or thank you, Alex. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate that amazing intro. Uh, <laughs> I'm humbled to say the least, but I appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited to talk to you. Oh, of course. I'm just like I told you last time we talked, I'm blown away by the work that you're doing and the quality of the interviews that you're putting out and the guests that you get on. So you are an inspiration to me and I'm sure so many others. Yeah. So- well, you and, and just to, just to, you know, to toot your horn as well, you have been an inspiration to me because you're one of the few shows that I actually started watching before I jumped into this world uh, to see how it was done properly. So you've been doing the good work as well, my dear. So congratulations on all the amazing work that you do. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that so much. So I'd like to start out by just for anybody who isn't familiar with your background, um, it, could you talk a little bit about your professional history? And then after that, we'll get into your your spiritual journey. Sure. So I, uh, I've i been in the film industry for close to 30 years, and uh, I've directed movies, uh, TV shows, commercials, music videos, and owned my own post-production house for many years, almost two decades doing editing, color grading, and I probably finished around 50, 50 or 60 features in my day. Uh, and uh, that's kind of where I started off. Uh, I have a lot of adventures uh, in that in that world in those 30 years. I, I have my first book was about how I almost made a $20 million movie for the mob, uh, where I was stuck inside uh, this gangster's life for about a year who threatened my life on a daily basis. Uh, while he was being, while I was being flown out to LA, meeting the biggest movie stars in the world, uh, and the block, you know, billion dollar producers and so on. When I was 26, that experience is pretty much, I think the catalyst for my, not only my spiritual journey, but my professional journey as well. And how got, what it got me started to get into podcasting, helping other people, trying to show people how to avoid pitfalls because that I think scarred me. Uh, it is it's probably my great one of my great traumas in life uh and i'm very grateful for that trauma uh but uh in 2015 i launched uh a podcast and an online business uh in the filmmaking space uh called indie film hustle and uh very quickly came became number 1 in that space uh, as a podcaster and it started to grow it and grow it and grow it and then launched another podcast and screenwriting uh but all living inside of the filmmaking space and uh, we, I think, now are up to over a thousand episodes of both of those uh, those shows. Uh, I, I'm prolific to say the least. I'm not. I might not be good, but I'm prolific uh, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> so, uh, and then about two years ago, um, I have a spiritual guide who has been working with me for most of my life, alive. I have to preface that, uh, alive. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to preface it in our world. Uh, I, she is, uh, she's been a, a spiritual guide to me for most of my life. I probably met her in my twenties. And, uh, and she turned to me one day and she's like, you know, this filmmaking stuff is nice and all, but it's time for you to open up a spiritual podcast. And I said, yeah. what? <laughs> What are you talking about? I'm not a spiritual guy. I 
I have no street credibility in that space. In filmmaking, of course, I've been doing it for so long. I can speak from a place of experience. I have no idea about it. She's like, you've been studying spirituality for most of your life. I go, yeah, yeah, but it's like a side hustle. You know, <laughs> spirituality was kind of like a side, you know, I you know, read autobiography of a yogi and go down in the Vedic traditions and started going into yogic philosophy and, and Taoism. And I started just doing a whole bunch of, but that's just my own curiosity, ancient civilizations, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And she's like, no, I think it's time and you have to do it uh, fairly quickly. She, I'm like, okay, when do you want me to do it? She's like, three weeks. I go, I'm sorry, you want me to launch a brand new podcast in a space that I don't know anything about in three weeks, website, podcast, guests, logo, Uh everything. She's like, yes. I go, you know, that's impossible. She goes, it is for most people, (laughs) but not for you. And I'm like, "Eh, all right. So I did. And three weeks later, I had a show. I had a few big guests uh, show up. Uh, I had a rock star show up magically where who big giant rock star, the lead singer of iron maiden talking about spirituality I had Moby show up um, for everybody of a certain age. Moby was a huge, huge music star in the nineties. And, uh, and I had a bunch of other people start showing up. And as I was going through that process, I got uh, scared uh, because it was, it was quiet. It was, I was living a double life. So I was doing the filmmaking stuff and then I was doing this quietly over here, but then I got scared and I started to pull back because I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to lose what I've built. I don't want people to think I'm a crazy guy now because he's talking about spirits, spirituality and, and near death experiences and stuff like that. So I got scared. I pulled back and I was, I pulled back for about three months. I stopped. I was doing a podcast every other week. So if you know my output, that's how terrified I was. Wow. Yeah, because <laughs> like do- we were just saying, you put out shows every day on multiple channels. <laughs> right. So <laughs> for me to be doing one every other week, it's just me just barely even doing anything. And then I finally pulled back, made a whole bunch of excuses. Oh, I got to do this. I got to do that. And then it was Christmas of 2021. Uh, I got I got a kind of wake up call. And then I just decided to say, okay, look, God, sat down and had a conversation with God and said, look, if you want me to do this, I'll do it. I'll go all in. Uh, I will take a leap of faith that you will guide me to wherever you want me to go with this situation. And I will build a set, which is what you're seeing in front of you. I'll buy, I'll get a little system. I'll get a camera. I'll I'll, I'll do it right. I won't kind of like half-ass it like I've been doing. In my opinion, at least I was half-assing it. And, And I'm like, I'm all in. So starting in January of 2022, we had around 800 subscribers. And then by the end of 2022, we had 55,000 subscribers, which is a massive growth, uh, something like that. And then now uh, we just broke 220, I almost had 220,000 subscribers. And we're getting millions and millions of views every month. And... I don't know what's going on. I'm just doing what I can to, to put the word out there. But that was the power of this story. I was like, I just took a leap of faith and mm-hmm. fell into where I was supposed to be doing my work wow. and not to be afraid of it. And when I did that, doors swung open and guests started to show up and conversations were happening. And like I've been telling people, I'm just kind of holding on for the ride right now. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm just holding on, uh, not for dear life, but just still holding on <laughs> because the train is going pretty fast and it's going, it's getting faster. So it's kind of like I'm acclimating to the process as we're going through it. But it is a great example of when you decide to go all in and have faith in the in the universe guiding you and source guiding you on the path that you're supposed to be on. Um, is It's very similar to uh, from my world in the storytelling world, the call to adventure. Uh, if you have ever seen Star Wars, or yeah. any major, every major movie, there's always a call to adventure where they're like, you have to leave your ordinary world, where your your ordinary world is the world you live in every day. Mm-hmm. And you're like, no, I, my house got burned down. I got to go off and become a starfighter with Luke, you know, and, and become a Jedi. And he's like, no, 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 I don't want to go. That that refusal 
is part of the journey. And that was my refusal. I Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go. I was scared. Because if you're not scared by the call to adventure, then you're insane. Because generally, it's pushing you in a place that you're outside of your boundaries. And and that that call to adventure could be a relationship. It could be a new job. It could be uh, moving to another country, another city. It could be a big change, whatever that is in your life. I could be leaving a relationship, leaving a job, leaving, you know, moving to another country. Mm-hmm. It, it, it depends on where you're at, but it is scary. So I was terrified, honestly, because it was my livelihood. I, I'd really been just podcasting for years and that was what fed my family. So I was really right. scared of putting that into jeopardy by this new crazy spiritual podcast that made no sense on paper. But as you continue to go through the process, it now makes all the sense in the world. And as it continues to move forward, I'm like, okay, this does make sense. This is where I'm supposed to be. These are the conversations that are really intriguing to me now to talk about, you know, the nature of reality. Uh, you know, what is a soul? Is there an afterlife? Uh, all these dark, big, giant questions that we all ask on our shows is so interesting and endless. It will never end. Oh yeah, I will never, never get bored by these topics because it's just so massive of questions as opposed to where I am in the filmmaking space, which is, it's, it's interesting and it's fun, Mm -hmm. but um, at a certain point you, you run into walls on certain things because you only ask about these, you know, what's a, what's a story arc. Okay. What's uh, this? uh, We, we, we've heard it a bunch of times here. I'm surprised every time I have a conversation, like when we had our conversation, which, uh, which hasn't aired yet, uh, about your pre-birth experience. I'm like, pre-birth experience? That's amazing. Like, what is that? I'm like, I just discovered that like a few months ago. I'm like, is that a thing? Apparently that's a thing. So that's a, that's a long question to a short answer. I I talk for a living, Melissa, so stop me. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I, I loved hearing that. And one thing that stuck out to me is I heard you, I think it was in a previous interview or somewhere, talk about how you had, tr- there were things that you tried to accomplish in your career and you kept getting so close, but just not hitting mm-hmm. it. And then all of a sudden you just fall into this, not fall into it. Obviously you've worked very hard, but it, in the sense that it wasn't what you were expecting so it's just interesting to me how how that works like when we get in alignment when we find our purpose and the doors just start swinging open like you said so i guess my question is does what you're doing now feel different in any way than what you were doing previously as far as your state of consciousness and how you're interacting with everything oh absolutely i mean look I've been in love with movies since I was a kid and it has been my dream to be a Steven Spielberg or a Martin Scorsese or any of these or Tarantino or one of these big giant directors. And it's, I think the goal of every filmmaker to, to get to those heights. Um, You wouldn't, you generally don't become a filmmaker to be like, you know, I just want to do small things. I just want to, you do some, some people do, but most filmmakers want that grandiose, big, big uh, sandbox to play in. And I, like I said, gotten into the room so many times with big movie stars, big producers, and I kept getting to the room. I'm like, I'm good enough to get in these rooms, but why isn't something popping? Like, why is there always a block? Why can't the, the project doesn't go forward? And I was angry and bitter Oof, for a long time. I mean, the anger was, you could just sense it off of me because imagine not only getting to your dream so many times and then the door gets shut in your face again and again. But then having a company that helps other filmmakers fulfill their dreams by finishing their movies. And then many times I had to fix their movies and save their movies and editing and color grading and visual effects. And I'm like, who gave this guy 3 million bucks? And I can't get uh, you know, a few million bucks to make my first movie. Like what, the, what this doesn't make sense. It's not fair. And like this angry, all this kind of stuff. And then when I jumped into this world, um, I started to understand the process. See, the thing is that we do not understand the grand picture because we don't know the grand picture. So if you think that you know the grand picture, you're wrong. Whatever you think is going to happen is probably not going to happen in the exact way that you're seeing it because we don't know what's best for us in the long term. So I almost made it on 
to two reality shows. Uh, back in the day, I was almost on Project Greenlight. I made it to the very, very end. And I was also on another show by Steven Spielberg called On the Lot. And I made it to the very end, flown out the whole ball of whack and didn't get in. And at the time, I'm like, oh my God, my world is over. I didn't get in. And then years later, you go, thank God I didn't get into those shows because it destroyed the, basically destroyed the, 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 the careers of those directors. None of them ever made it out of it um, because it was like no one took them seriously because they were a reality show. So when we want something, it's not necessarily something that we need or is good for us. Mm. And if you just go back to when you were a kid, when you were a kid, you wanted to eat the ice cream all day long. And if you got what you wanted at that point, you would have gotten sick, diabetes, right. other things like that. <laughs> so throughout our lives, we might want something, but you have to understand that it, it might not be in your grand best for you in the grand scheme of things. So then I analyze going back and go, why did I? And I kept asking this question. I know a lot of people listening might, might relate. Why have I been giving the love and the passion for this career if I'm always getting just a couple steps short? Why would God do that to me? I was angry. Like, why would you do that? Like, And I, I would always say, why would you do this to me? Like, I don't understand. I obviously have the skills. I obviously have the experience. I have the talent to, you know, just to get in the door. I could make a living doing this. I don't think I'll be speaking Spielberg but I can make a living doing this and be really happy. Why am I not getting to these projects that I want to get into? And you look back now and you go, oh, I think that the reason why I'm able to do everything that I'm doing now in Next Level Soul is because of all the training I received mm -hmm. in my career. That's why the, I try to produce a good show. That's why I do it so fast. That's why I do it so efficiently. That's why I did six years of the other podcasts. And then talking to all and, and and honing my interviewing skills, you know, before I ever did in the, uh, before I ever did Next Level Soul, I already had probably the seven eight hundred interviews under me, with mm -hmm. some very heavy hitters. Right. So I was re I was kind of already ready to go. So if you look back, you see the perfection in everything, mm -hmm. and it's only when you look back, not when you're in the the mud, but when you look back and you go, oh that. That was perfect. Oh, I got fired from that job. And two months later, I, I launched my pot, my post-production company. Mm. And I would have, because I, I wouldn't have left that job unless that new supervisor came in who didn't like me and ousted me. Cause I would have stayed there because I kept saying, ah, oh, the money's easy. Mm -hmm. But when I got that push, I launched my, my, my post-production company and so on and so forth. So throughout life, you get these little nudges and pushes. And when you go against the grain, that's when you start feeling a lot of pain. <laughs> right. uh, you feel a lot of pain when you go against the grain. And when I finally just let go and said, I'm all in, I am going to trust that you will guide me. It's the first time I'd ever done that in my life. Completely, mm -hmm. wholeheartedly, egolessly, you are in charge. Like, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to show up I'm going to cut the wood and I'm going to carry the water because mm -hmm. you have to work. You have to do the work. Oh yeah. But how it, how it ends up is not in your control. And many times I was talking to somebody the other day, I was like, Oh, you know, I really would like this to happen. And I want to get this much money for that. And they're like, don't do that. Just say you want this to happen and you might get more money where you have a bigger opportunity that you're not seeing. Don't block yourself in with your own limitations, which is a huge, huge lesson in my life. Just kind of let things go and, and see what unfolds in front of you and trust that whatever is unfolding in front of you is for your best, negative and positive. And we can deep, go deeper into those concepts as well, if you like. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a couple of things that come to mind. And the first one is this concept of surrender or non-attachment as the host of a spiritual podcast i'm i'm sure this comes up all the time for you i know it does for me to where it all comes back to surrendering into the divine flow of life and mm -hmm. and that's when things happen whether you're talking about a near-death experience of somebody's panicking and then they surrender and then their their guide appears or right. um or just in life, if you're 
stuck. You can't figure things out. And then you surrender. And that's when things finally happen because you're no longer um, striving for a certain outcome or trying to make something happen. Then things can just flow. Yeah, it's it's like either you're going to you're either going to surrender the easy way or you're going to surrender the hard way. And in and, and many ways, when you surrender, uh, it means, in other words, if you're being pushed in a certain direction because that is your purpose and you keep rejecting it, you're going to get those nudges and those those kind of, you know, hey, tap on the shoulder. Eventually, they're going to turn into punches. Eventually, mm-hmm. they're going to turn into sledgehammers. And eventually, a house is going to fall on you. So you're going to be so exhausted. You're going to get to that place where you're either physically broken, mentally broken, emotionally broken, to the point where you're like, I just give up. I can't anymore. And that's when the magic begins. Or you can skip all that pain and just let go, right. which is what I did. Which is what I did. Because I was already starting to feel pain from not doing the, not doing what I was supposed to be doing on, on the show. So because of that, I started to, I said, I decided to finally let go. Uh, I, again, it was uh, a little whisper and a little push, a little nudge until I finally let go. And it just, it was, it didn't happen instantly. And that's the other thing that people need to understand. It's not going to be like, I'm letting go tomorrow. Everything will be okay. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> I started in January to do that work. I didn't get my first big episode until July, Mm -hmm. which there was a near-death experience episode that kind of popped Mm -hmm. and it broke a hundred thousand, which was like, you know, you know how, you know how it is. Very exciting when something like that happens. Yeah. You're just like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then it went, (laughs) and then it went down and I'm like, okay, what happened? How do I, what's going on? And you start to like, try to figure out how can I do that again? And then um, so that was a six month process of cutting wood and carrying water, building up this content. So I said, okay, I'm going to do two a week. All right, let me do three a week. And then towards the end of the year, I'm like, yeah, you know what? Let's just do four a week. Uh, and that's insane, by the way, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> but, but then, um, and then October 11th is when the first episode really took off. Then the next episode took off and next episode. And then this, this growth started and it was like kind of a, a snowball effect, but that's a, that's a good amount of time. And it could be years sometimes, depending on where you are in your journey and what you're doing. You just have to realize you have to just cut that wood and carry the water and mm-hmm. just do the work and let everything else be handled by powers beyond what you can think of and comprehend and things to seem to work out better. At least this is from someone who's been around the block a couple times on the, on, on Earth, right? <laughs> Just well, a couple times. Yeah. The other thing that I was gonna say is, um, when I first discovered near death experiences, and this was eight years ago, along mm-hmm. quite quite a little bit, they were not taken seriously. I mean, there was me a couple channels you could go to listen to a handful of them. I know coast to coast AM and maybe yeah. one other and. And and then as time has gone on, people have taken them more and more seriously and more podcasts have popped up. And then when you were talking about how you were not able to reach the level of success that you wanted to in your career, but you built up all of this experience. And now here you are giving credibility to this spirituality space because you have the experience, you have the set, you know what you're doing and you you're getting hundreds of thousands of views on your videos and so i just want to i just want to say thank you for <laughs> thank going you through so everything much. that you did and getting to this point um to be able to make the impact that you're making now oh i appreciate that very much it it's it's i am a cog in the wheel that's all i am i'm just i am just i'm, I'm just here to do the work and uh i you know as well as I do the the uh, the YouTube gods. Um, they are they are kind, uh, and they are vicious sometimes. Yes, and um, I've I'm learning how to speak to those gods in a better way, <laughs> <laughs> um, and understand what the gods want so they don't get angered. <laughs> uh, yes, but, but at the end of the day, but at the end of the day, you have absolutely no control of the of the algorithm and what it mm-hmm. does. Like when you got your first hundred thousand 
you know, view video. You were like, what did I, you, you, you didn't do anything different. No. Right. It was just like, all of a sudden you're just like, what's happening? Why is this happening? Oh my God. Oh my God. And then, then it goes away and you're just like, what happened? Can't, why can't that happen on all the videos? Right. And then it's like, <laughs> why can't this happen on all the videos? Uh, and then you start, uh, you start to learn a little bit more. And at least with me, because I put out so much content, my learning curve is much faster than most mm -hmm. shows because I'm putting out so much content. I see trial error, trial error, trial error, as opposed to trial error. Mm -hmm. So it's a much faster clip. So because of that learning curve uh, and moving faster, I'm able to see how things work a little bit faster. And I've gotten deeper, deeper, I mean, really into the, into the, the matrix of the YouTube and trying mm -hmm. to understand it because my goal is to get this message out to a mainstream audience. Uh, you know, it's easy. You know, as well as I do, it's a lot easier to preach to the people who've already drank the Kool-Aid. Super easy to do that. And that's fine. And you can do that. But my goal is to try to get this information to people who've never heard a near-death experience, yeah. mm -hmm. who's never heard of a channeler, who's never really thought about how quantum physics and spirituality mix, has never really thought about how the pyramids were built and what the implications are to us spiritually on that. Um, all of these deeper questions, that's who I'm after because that's how we're going to change the planet and awaken more and more people because people who are already awakened will watch this and will enjoy this. But my goal is to not only serve them, but to serve people that are coming in behind them. And that is the goal of the show. And I'm very, uh, it's my job to be the curator of what comes out on my channel and to curate the messages that go out to the people who are seeing it. And now as the show has gotten bigger, it becomes a deeper responsibility because it's one thing when, you know, 500 people or a thousand people are watching, which is a lot of people, by the way. But when you start getting millions, you really got to be able to go, okay, mm. what, what, okay. I got to really, I gotta take this seriously. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing a little bit of your journey with your professional life and getting into the podcast. Mm -hmm. Now I've, heard you talk before about how when this guide who was in your life suggested that you should start a, a spiritual podcast, you, you said that you had been a closet meditator for years. And so I'm mm -hmm. just curious to learn a little bit more about your spiritual journey. How did it start? Was there anything specific that really impacted you? Oh, that is a deep question. Um, my journey spiritually, I, I was raised Catholic. Um, so as I always joke and please all the Catholics calm the hell down and I use the word hell on purpose. Um, <laughs> I'm a I am a recovering Catholic. Yes. Um, but, uh, it's, it's good. It, you know, Catholicism and, and, and religion is great for some people and it works for them on their journey. It just didn't work for me. So whatever works for you and gets you closer to divine, I'm all about, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, God, Godspeed. But for me, even when I was in first grade, <clears throat> the the rules that they set up didn't make sense to me, you know, like, Oh, you know, you, you can, you, you can make sin, but if you sure, if you show up on Saturday and talk to a priest, uh, you'll be absolved. I'm like, so I can kill somebody on Monday and on Tuesday, I just go and go, Hey, I kill somebody. Oh, seven L Mary's and you're fine. Like it, it didn't make sense to me at that age. Even I started questioning those ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm a fairly rebellious soul. In general, I don't like uh, people telling me what to do as a general statement. I have been, I've been trouble in school since I was in kindergarten. Um, so as I started to go down there, uh, down the path, as I got into my 20s, um, certain ideas started to percolate, but I really didn't go deep into them until I started um, working with the spiritual uh, guide who was brought into my life for a very specific reason, obviously. And she started to drop certain ideas of books in, into place. Like, hey, you know, you should read this. Well, you should read that. And I started reading a book called The World Within by Gina. Oh God, I forgot her last name. It's sitting right here. Where is it? It's back here, son. It's back here. Yeah, it's right there. The World Within by Gina Carminia. She wrote a few books in regards to reincarnation, in regards to um, the soul and, and and these ideas started to really kind of 
I'm like, what is this? Starting to make more sense to me. And and she kind of stepped me through a lot of these things. By the way, during my 20s, I was a egomaniac. I was crazy. I was like, you know, it was in my 20s. So I wasn't the best student, but I still remembered some of this stuff and started getting into it. Then she introduced me to Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda. When I read it the first time, I couldn't, I couldn't grasp it. It was too far beyond me. I'm like, what? Yogic power? Like, what is this? Wasn't ready for it. Uh, it wasn't until 10 or 15 years later when I read it again that it opened, it just exploded in my mind. Um, but I'd always been interested and started um studying Taoism, Buddhism. Um, Confucianism. I just started going to Hinduism. I just started going down all of these spiritual philosophies, spiritual uh, religions, and just kind of just diving into everything because I was curious. And I also love ancient history and civilizations and lost history. And, you know, it's a storyteller in me, you know. Don't get me started on Atlantis. I'll talk for hours on just that. It's like Plato and he did Ooh, this. Anyway. Maybe I should ask you about that. <laughs> <laughs> this is a whole other, I just, that's, that's a new, new category of videos that I'm putting out now is going to be about ancient civilizations and lost history because I just love it. I love, as my wife calls it, old rocks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so as I started to uh, do that. I was, uh, again, my spiritual guide told me, she's like, you start meditating. Like, I tried many times to meditate, but my mind was always so like, T -t 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 -t. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And then I finally got down to like maybe a five minute practice. <laughs> she's like, that's ridiculous. You're getting nowhere in five minutes. <laughs> she's very, she's very tough. She's a very tough, uh, very tough soul. Uh, she's like less than an hour. You're not really doing much. She said, uh, I'm like, and that's just for me, everybody else could be doing 10 minutes here, 15 minutes there, whatever helps helps. But for my practice and what I was doing, she's like, you really got to get started at least at, at, at a 45 minute to an hour practice. So I did. And I started to slowly get used to it and slowly started doing an hour, two hours. I think my record at one sitting is a four and a half hour sitting. I haven't been, I haven't done that in years. Um, but I average now anywhere between an hour to two hours in a sitting, sometimes two to three hours a day, depending on the day. Hour minimum is my minimum for a day. Day, I don't go a day without meditating. If I can help it, um, I'll wake up early and I'll just leave the family. I'll just, just so I can meditate. And as that practice started to grow and grow, um, the awareness started to grow more and more. I've been doing it now probably six years, six years heavily, um, meaning I do it often. And your awareness kind of goes from this for everyone listening. I have my hands really close. It just starts to widen out and you just start to see things a little bit differently. Um, I calmed down a lot. The anger started to go away. This is all pre next level soul. So the anger started to go away a little bit more. You become more at peace. Um, again, not perfect. We all have our moments, but much better than it was before. So that kind of opened up. And the more I started studying the the, the Vedic texts, uh, yogic philosophy, which is where I really gravitate to, and uh, these deeper ideas, meditation has been just such an integral part of that. And um, I mean, I got the name of Next Level Soul in a meditation. I literally asked, hey, God, I need a name. You want me to do this? I need a name. And they're like, and all of a sudden, next level. So I'm like, that sounds cool. And I just wrote it down. I'm like, okay, that's the name. And no one's got it. Great. Let's do this. And that was, so a lot of things come to me in meditations. A lot of times uh, I'll ask a question and it'll come back to me. The answer will come into my meditation. Meditation is the key to spiritual growth. Uh, it is absolutely the key, at least in, from my point of view. And from many masters point of view, uh, meditation is the way to become deeper with the divine, deeper within the power within yourself uh, and kind of start to take away the, the, the illusion of, of this reality a little bit more. You start, and I, I use this all the time, the matrix. It's one of my favorite movies. One of the more spiritual movies ever made. Um, you start to see the code more in the reality and you start to see what's really kind of happening in many ways. And I don't say that as a woo-woo situation. I say that like you could start seeing 
people's intentions. You can start seeing situations differently. Things that you were blind to before, you can see coming a mile away because you're much more open, much more wide to these ideas. Uh, you know, I have no magical powers. I don't see auras. I don't, you know, any of that stuff. I would love to, but I don't see dead people um, or anything like that. But it just starts to open your awareness to things a little bit differently. So it is the key for me to do it. And the deeper and the longer I go, <clears throat> the better it seems to be um, for my practice. So I hope that's a long, again, I can talk for hours, Melissa. You have to stop me. <laughs> oh no, I had you on here to talk. So I'm <laughs> loving hearing everything. Uh, there's a couple of questions that I get a lot from people about meditation. And the first one is, of course, I can't quiet my mind. I can't meditate no matter what I do. So I'm just curious. Well, first of all, how long did it take for you to get to the point where you could sit and meditate for an hour? It took me a little while. It didn't take me that as long as I, I thought because at the place I was in my life, I was a little bit better. Like in my 20s, it's just so much. The ego is at full force. At least it was me. It was like, oh, and I had certain I had a certain amount of success in my career and had a certain amount of money that was coming in. I was just, thank God I didn't get that $20 million movie. Uh, or thank God, I would have self-destructed. I would have destroyed myself with the ego. It was so out of control. So it took me, I don't know, probably a few months. But, you know, I have the same problem as everybody else does. And I've spoken to Tibetan monks about this and yogis about this, uh, about meditation. And they all say, you know, the, the mistake most people make is that you have to quiet the mind. The mind's not going to quiet that way. You can't try to quiet the mind. What you can do is acknowledge the thought that comes in and let it go through its natural path, but don't try to resist it is the key. Just let it go. When another one comes in, that's fine. Let it go. And sometimes those thoughts just keep coming, but eventually the thoughts will start to slow and it'll start to go down less and less to the place where then there is no thoughts anymore. So you haven't done it yourself it's not possible. Again, from my understanding, talking to Tibetans, Tibetan monks and yogis, like to quiet the mind that way takes an sense, an immense amount of skill from years and years and years. And even they were like, yeah, you just let the thoughts flow in because that's part of the plot, the, you know, the rules of this game down here mm -hmm. in reality. These thoughts are going to keep coming in. Once they kind of get tired, it just kind of just lessens, lessens, lessens to the point where there's nothing. And that's where you get into the magic place. And that's where you get into the euphoria. And that's where you get into the blissful states and um, all of that stuff. But you you don't stop the thoughts. If you resist the thoughts that just keep getting stronger, you let them go. You let them go. And, you let go. and, you know, just like when you're about to fall asleep, you know, thoughts will come in and then they're like, you know, I got to change the, I got to change uh, the car, the oil in the car. Oh, but my mom's going to be coming over this weekend. But oh yeah, but then my mom, oh my God, this is going to happen now. And then, oh, my sister's coming over. Blah, 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 blah. And then, and you, you, and all of a sudden you started off with oil change at the end. You're like, and the world's going to end. Like <laughs> <laughs> Those thought patterns in your brain. So it's similar like that in meditation. You just kind of let, but you just let that, that fizzle out to the point where you just let it gets to a point. And, you know, sometimes you do fall asleep. I haven't done that in a while, but you do fall asleep and that's okay. There is no successful or unsuccessful meditation practice. It's just making the intention of what you want to do. And eventually with every day showing up, cutting the wood, carrying the water, uh, you will get to a certain place uh, with it. And it does I mean, and I have, uh, I like, I have the aura ring who checks my, um, my, my heart rate while I'm going down and things like that. And I use, a, I love using the muse, the, uh, the fee biofeedback band around your head. It's amazing. Uh, just because I want to check my stats as I'm going down and it, and it shows you where, where your brain waves are going, your heart waves, your heart is going and I'm like, oh, good. Look, look how low my heart rate got. So it starts dropping your heart rate. I've had blood work done and my doctor just looks at it and goes, you meditate, don't you? And I go, yeah. Wow. He's like, yeah, your heart, your blood, your blood levels on this and this are super low comparatively for a person of your age. 
and it doesn't make any sense why it's that low, but because you meditate, that's the only thing I've seen is meditators wow. do that. So I've had that happen with me sometimes too. So meditation is such a, it's just everything. It really is. Mm. It helps your body, your mind, your brain. It's just such a powerful tool and it's simple. It's free. Uh, it's, it's not complicated. Um, it's just, you can't allow the ego to get involved. Mm. That's when people fail is because of like, Oh, I had a bad meditation. No, don't judge it. It is what it is. You had an intention. You went down it. You know, it's kind of like going up and playing baseball. You know, sometimes you swing, sometimes you get a home run, sometimes mm. you strike out, but you show up every day and you get better every day by doing this, by taking the swings and little by little, if you don't judge yourself, which is tough, <laughs> you will find uh you will find your your groove. Mm. Well there's so many directions we could go here but I guess I'll go back to that other question the second question that people have a lot of times about meditation is when do you fit it in especially for okay someone like you you're married you have kids you you are putting out so much content um working really hard so when do you find the time to prioritize your own spiritual growth? I it is it is part of my daily routine. So I usually like to meditate earlier than later at later time for me it's that everyone's different but if I meditate at night I tend to go out and it, and if I go out I'm like I'm I'm sleeping and I'm like it's too I'm too tired in the morning I, I feel, this is my own practice. I, I like to meditate in the morning, sometimes in the afternoon, but I can't do evenings. Uh, I've tried and it just is tough to do evenings for me. So I just prioritize it. I wake up early. I'm an early riser. I wake up anywhere between 4, 4.30 in the morning. Um, that's a good day. Sometimes in the threes, 3.30, 3.45, I try not to do that, but I don't do it. It's just my body does it naturally. Um, if I sleep until five or six, I'm like, woof, I've slept too much. I'm going to be exhausted all day. Uh, so I, I wake up early and I'll sneak it in, you know, in the, I'll sneak an hour here, hour there. If it's during my work day, I just work around. I schedule it in my work day. Mm -hmm. I have, a, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have a job that I can make my own schedule. But for people who have a nine to five, you just, you got to find a way. It's the same way you find a way to, to watch TV to you know, binge Netflix, to do other things that are not helping you grow spiritually. If it's a priority in your life, you find a, you find thirty minutes here, you find an hour there. You know, I'm lucky enough that I control my schedule, and sometimes I can I can meditate for two or three hours. Mm -hmm. You know, without affecting my workload. You know, and still go to the gym, and still you know spend time with my family and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's very possible. It's just all about priority and where you right. want to sneak it in. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think one thing that you and I have in common that might be an interesting topic mm -hmm. is that this the fascination with the yogic paths and the great masters of that uh, spiritual path. I know for myself, I was raised Christian, and so I was raised with all the stories about Jesus and his supernatural abilities and what he could do. And mm -hmm. I there was always this like, I don't know, this desire to understand it more or like there's something I'm missing here. And now as an adult, I've discovered that that the Hindu tradition basically has all the answers to this and has like real living, breathing people who are living this out. You mentioned Autobiography of a Yogi, which I'm reading currently. <laughs> and I'm just thinking to myself, how did I not discover this when I was younger? Because it has everything I wanted to know. And you're hearing mm -hmm. these stories of uh, Sri Yukteswar, his master, who's uh, this Christ-like figure. And then you interviewed someone recently. I can't remember her name, but she was a disciple of Kalashwar. And he... yeah. yeah. So I, what are your thoughts on, <laughs> on these great oh. masters and the things they can do? How long do you have? Uh, this is a topic <laughs> that I am fascinated with. Um, Yogananda was my gateway drug, if you will, into, into this world. And when you start d diving deeper into Yogananda, you discover the lineage of Yogananda, which starts with Babaji, the Hira Mahasha, Yukteswa, Yogananda. And I think there's a couple after Yogananda. I haven't I've, I stopped at Yogananda, but there's a few other living ones. 
in, in our generations have been that have kept that that lineage going. Um, you start digging deeper and deeper into the yogic philosophies. They are profound, profound yeah. ideas. And they, at least for me, rang very, very true. They're very, um, God, I mean, I, I, there's so many, there's so many books, the Vedic texts alone have so much information about, I mean, they were talking about quantum physics 6,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, they're talking about a lot of these ideas, the, uh, the idea of the illusion uh, or the dream, you know, that we're in, uh, which is basically simulation theory, uh, which is what's going on now. Um, the, to answer your specific question in regards to the masters and the ascended masters, which is also one of my favorite topics to talk about on the show is ascended masters. Jesus was an ascended master. Mm -hmm. I was always curious about what happened to the time where Jesus, you know, was born. Uh, I think at 12 was the last story in the Bible with him and yeah. then yada, 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 yada. Uh, I'm the, the second coming uh, or I'm the first coming. Uh, and, and then he becomes who we know. So I'm like, well, what happened during the yada, yada, yada? If I right. could quote Seinfeld, uh, <laughs> what happened during the, and that's, that was very interesting to me. That also didn't make sense to me. Like, why is that blocked out? Like you have so much information about all this stuff about him, but that story, what, you know, what happened during the teenage years? What happened during the twenties? You know, uh, if they're anything like what happened to me, <laughs> they're going to probably be exciting. Uh, <laughs> so I started digging deeper into it. And then you started looking into Hinduism and the yoga texts and Jesus is all over the place. He's renowned. Oh, yeah. It's so Jesus obvious. Jesus is re Jesus is renowned in India. He mm -hmm. is a great yogi in the Hindu tradition. And Yogananda, when he came to the States, was, you know, he had Jesus up there with Yukteswar and Babaji, you know, um, as my painting behind me states, like that all the masters mm -hmm. sitting around uh, in the Himalayan mountains. So it was so obvious afterwards and and that you that that um for my research i found that jesus went to to china he went to tibet and he ended off in in india learning different aspects of the spiritual path learning meditation learning um yogic powers that come along with high levels of awareness and self-realization um but when you start studying you you put the yogic filter on Jesus's work, then you go, oh, he's yogic powers. Mm -hmm. Everything he's talking about has been discussed thousands of years prior to Jesus's arrival uh, on the planet. So, okay, that all makes sense. Um, but the paths of like Jesus, uh, Yogananda, who I'm just such a fan of, if you will, I'm a fanboy of Yogananda. Uh, <laughs> his path um, if you, if anybody's ever interested, this uh, this book that I have behind me is called Awake. It's based on his documentary about Yogananda's uh, path. Uh, it's a wonderful documentary. I've had the filmmakers on the show uh, multiple times, and I've I watch that movie probably three or four times a year, just because it just I don't know why. Just I keep I keep being brought back into his world, mm. and it's such a beautifully done uh, documentary about his life. It it really shows what he went through to get to where he was. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy when he went to become, when he, when he finally met Yukteswa, which is his yogi, right. his master, um, he, his guru, uh, it, it was 10 years with him, basically sweeping floors. He was, his ego was being broken down by, mm -hmm. by Yukteswa. And, and even Yogananda said it's like the ego is a horrible thing in that way because I needed to, it needed to be beaten out of me almost in many ways. And I just had to humble myself and humble myself to the point where, you know, cut wood, carry water. Mm -hmm. and th th that comes from, I say that a lot, but that comes from, a, I think it's a Zen, a Zen uh, Buddhist saying, it's like, before I found enlightenment, I was cutting wood and carrying water. Yeah. Well, what do you do after enlightenment? I cut wood and carry water mm -hmm. you know it's nothing changes in that sense so yogananda's path was the same way and then you start studying people like saint germain and all these other ascended masters throughout history their paths are all similar in the sense of what they have to do to find enlightenment within themselves or self-realization but what they all have in common is they all want to help <clears throat> they all want to help humanity 
mm. and and share what they've learned. Buddha, obviously, is another one. Um, they all want to send to help all of us evolve and awaken to a higher state of consciousness. Right. It's it's kind of like again, it's you know, you go back to the Matrix and it's it's Morpheus telling you, you know, you you don't know. We have to unplug you. So you are aware of the reality. You're like, oh, so the matrix isn't real. Oh, okay. And there's like one day's like he said, when uh, the quote, I think Morphe's like, so you mean I'll be able to dodge bullets? He goes, No, you'll learn not to even have to dodge bullets. Yes. You know, My favorite this is so, line. I was like, what? It's like, oh, and when he met the kid, uh, the Buddhist, it was like a Buddhist uh monk kid at the um at the Oracle's house. Yeah bending the spoon. And he's like, how do you do that? He goes, first, you have to understand that there is no spoon. Mm-hmm. And you're like, what is going on? And like, then it's the answer. So you start getting into these deeper ideas of reality and what this all is. Mm-hmm. And the masters all talk about it. If you're in, if you're, if you're in the autobiography of Yogi, have you gotten to the Babaji stuff yet? No. Um, I, if he, if I don't think to, so. I don't know. You'll so. know. You'll okay. know. You'll know. You'll touch upon Babaji. Babaji is the master of masters. He is the one that teaches all masters. He is, he is, uh, I've actually asked channels about Babaji just for fun mm-hmm. to see. And they go, uh, they, we don't have a lot of information. She go, I asked one channel and she said, they don't have a lot of information. Like, Hold on. Oh, he, they say that he is the master of all masters. And that's all we can say about that. I'm wow. Like, <laughs> Isn't Things he like the that. one that lived for thousands of years in the Himalayas? He's, he still is in the Himalayas, according to according to Yogananda. Wow. He can manifest according to Yogananda. He has the, he can manifest and stay manifest, mass, manifested on the planet for as long as he wants. He roams with a small um, group of followers that he handpicks uh, around the Himalayas. He materializes and dematerializes whenever he wants, and he's always working behind the scenes for humanity. So oh, wow. um, he he met with I think he met Yogananda once or twice in his life. Uh, there are stories of Babaji. He did I think apparently incarnate into into like a, a young boy's body, came out, did a bunch of stuff. This is in the '60s, so this is not long ago. There's pictures of him mm-hmm. um, and stories about what he was able to do, and then he just left. Like I think he was out, he was around for maybe a year or two, or maybe longer. Please forgive me. I'm not exactly what the the time is, but he came and he left, and it was like, oh, wait, that was Baba G. Like, yeah, that was Baba G. So he he is he is a great master, and you start getting into deeper into Baba G's world. Uh, it just it's just endless. It's an endless endless pool. It's like it's it's like trying to understand the scope of the universe. It just, it just goes on. This mm-hmm. information just goes on and on and on. And whenever you think you've got a little grasp on something, something just shows up. You're like, what? Oh yeah. I got to go down here. All right. I'm going down here now. And <laughs> so like, like, what? I just, I thought I had it all figured out. No, you don't. And you start going down there. So it starts to, you know, and, and doing the show that we do, you know, we're blessed because we get to talk to these amazing people all the time and ask whatever questions we want mm-hmm. of, of spiritual masters of, of uh, near death experiencers of anybody we want. So in a selfish way, we get to do and ask deep questions about what we are interested in. Uh, and then everybody else benefits who watches it. But that's an immense, I mean, I have what now we're closing in on 300 episodes soon on this show. That means I've talked to over 300 you know, spiritual beings, masters, mm-hmm. uh, you know, intellectuals, philosophers, you know, PhDs, quantum physicists, everything. That's an immense amount of knowledge and experience that you're building up. So mm-hmm. we were just starting this journey. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I feel incredibly <laughs> blessed to be doing this. Yeah. It's it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful, it's the best, for me, it's the best job ever. I absolutely love, I wake up in the morning. Sometimes I'm going to bed at night. I'm like, hurry up, hurry up. I want to get up. Um, I, I don't want to, that's probably yeah. why I wake up so early. It's like, hurry, hurry, <laughs> I got, I got, I got to get, 
I gotta go see what's going on on YouTube. Let's see. All right, let's go. I gotta get prepped for the, this next interview. So it's always like that for me, and mm-hmm. it, it's it's such a blessing uh, and an honor to do the work that I do every mm-hmm. day. And I'm sure you feel this as well. It is helping so many people around the world. Uh, I hear it all the time from emails and comments and people reaching out to me of how much the show and these conversations are truly changing people's lives in so many ways. And that's humbling to say the least. Mm. And I'm very, I don't take that for granted at all. So I, I hope to continue to be able to do this work in one form or another um, for the rest of my life, because it's something I can easily do for the rest of my life. There is no time limit on this. Uh, And it's a topic that everybody in the world wants to know what happens after we die. Everybody in the world wants to know the purpose of life. Everybody in the world wants to know, why am I here? Do we have free will? Is there a destiny? What are spirit guides? Are angels real? What's a channeler? You know, you know all these deeper questions about our, the nature of our reality. It is endless. And it seems to me, based on my numbers alone, but also on your show and things like that, as you were mentioning earlier, the curiosity about these things is growing. Yeah. It's exploded over the past year or two. Ever since the pandemic, I think mm-hmm. that really wasn't time for everyone to sit down for a minute and ask deep questions because they had nothing else to do. And there was a break. And then they were able to, it's changed a lot already about how we do work now, more remote work and what's important to me and things like that. But a lot of them were like, why am I here? And you start, mm-hmm. they had a second to go, wait a minute, what, what's the purpose of all of this? Is it really just to work nine to five for 30 years and retire off of a Roth IRA? Like right. is and 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 be so broken down that you can't even enjoy the money that you've saved? Like, is that life? And then you die? Like, that doesn't mm-hmm. make sense. Right. And this new generation is not putting up with that. Where the- Exactly. My parents' generation, your parents' generation, that was what they were sold. Yeah. We were sold that too, but we've kind of one foot in, one foot out. Mm-hmm. But the generation behind us is like, you guys can go screw yourself. Oh yeah. My kids no. <laughs> they see it's like they see right through everything. They they do. They're just like, what? Work where? How much? Not what? <laughs> no. I'm gonna no. That makes no sense whatsoever. So it's really interesting to see children as well. And this new generation coming up that are just they're not buying it. So a lot of these older systems that we grew up with are crumbling and will crumble. Mm-hmm. Um it has to has to in order to make room for this new awakening that is happening throughout the planet and throughout um humanity so i'm i'm excited to be here uh, doing the work that i'm doing i'm I'm excited to be able to speak to the people i speak to every day and my growth as a my own spiritual growth is something that i'm exponentially excited about i'm extremely patient now where i was not before i still have work to do we all do but uh, I look at things in years now, not in days or months or weeks. I look at things in years like, okay, next year we'll do this. And three years from now, we'll do this. I, I kind of plan out that far out now with what I do. And and as far as the spiritual stuff's concerned, I just like, I need to find enlightenment in <laughs> like, that's not like, no, that's <laughs> you don't find enlightenment. You don't find self-realization. Mm. It finds you when you are ready and you need to prep the mind, the body, all of that stuff for when it's time for you, for you to be aware of it. Mm Because imagine if you were given this information when you were 20, you wouldn't have been able to Mm -hmm. process it, right? You wouldn't have been able to even conceive of this stuff. Yeah. When I was 20, no. (laughs) No, just, you couldn't, you weren't, you weren't ready. It's like giving, it's like giving, uh, you know, a toolbox, a hammer and some nails and some wood to a five-year-old and like build a house. Like that's, they're not ready to process that. They can't understand what to do or give autobiography of a yogi to a five-year-old. Like <laughs> they're like, what? So it takes time to be able to build up the, the infrastructure in your own soul and your own consciousness to be able to accept these new ideas. And, and for anybody, and I, I don't know about you, do you find that 
I'm going to turn it around on you for a second. Do you find on your show um, from people who leave negative comments who are not ready to hear a lot of these things Mm -hmm. that it is that they are afraid of basically crumbling the foundation that they were built upon? Like you and I were both were, you know, like, well, wait a minute. If I believe in reincarnation, then everything the church has told me or my religion has told me has been a lie. And if that's the case, my entire foundation of my identity is gone. No, I can't have that happen. I have to fight back. I have to, you know, Mm -hmm. do you find that that happens with your stuff as well? I do, because I would say probably 90% of the really negative comments I get are from religious people. There's a Mm -hmm. few, I mean, you would think there would be a lot more criticizing it because it's woo woo or whatever, but there's, there's not. There's a very mm-hmm. small percentage. Most of the negative negative comments are are coming from people who are very religious. And so yeah, um fear of their their whole foundation crumbling, fear of accepting the fact that what they've been taught is maybe not the truth. Yeah. I think that, I think also it's like you can if you're listening, you can have two people with different ideas. Mm-hmm. Let coexist. It's okay. The ideas that we talk about are not for everybody. And that's okay. Everyone's on a different path. I'm not saying I'm right. You might be right. Who knows? Maybe we're born, you and I, Melissa, are going straight to hell. We're <laughs> going to both hang out in a pit of fire <laughs> and swim in lava for the rest of eternity. Maybe they are right. And I'm not making fun of it. I am slightly, but I'm, you know, but the point is that. They might be right, but that doesn't mean that two ideas can't exist at the same time. Mm -hmm. As long as you're not hurting anybody, you know, and and you're not really causing any damage or anything like that, you know, your beliefs are your beliefs. And if you're listening, and this is the funny thing is they're listening to shows like this. It's because there is either a curiosity that they need a scratched and there are seeds that are being planted Mm -hmm. that may never grow but may pop out in a year or two or 10 years or 20 years, who knows? But all ideas, all religions, all philosophies have a place in everyone's journey. Oh yeah. And that is because they chose that journey, whether they believe though they, they chose it or not, they chose that journey for them in this life. Um, and if it has a place and it has a purpose. So I don't ever want to negate other people's beliefs but don't uh, you don't have to attack other people that have different beliefs because you know there's no one there's no one way of looking at the elephant. Everyone has a different perspective on the elephant. You know that whole old mm-hmm. proverb of the eight blind men. Tell me what the elephant is, and the one's grabbing the tail, and it's like the elephant is obviously the tail, and the other one's grabbing the the leg. Obviously, it's the leg. And the, uh, this is what an elephant is, and this is uh, the trunk is obviously what the elephant is but no one's seeing the whole picture. Mm-hmm. So that is kind of the, hopefully what, we, what what hopefully that's a message I can get out there. Yeah, I love that analogy. Alex, thank you so much for taking the time to come and share with us about your personal journey. And yes. I like to give you a chance for anybody, like I said, most of my viewers already know who you are, but for anybody <laughs> who doesn't, where can they find you? Um, you can head over to uh, nextlevelsoul.com. You could search on YouTube, Next Level Soul. Uh, those are the big, the, the two places to find me. It's not hard to find us, uh, but nextlevelsoul.com is the hub of everything. And then YouTube, just type in the word Next Level Soul and and, and we'll come up. And uh, we've got a, got a couple of shows. <laughs> out yeah. There. We release, we release, I think four to, we release five to six a week, depending on how I'm feeling. Uh, but four brand new ones every week for sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just trying to trying to do good for the world and trying to awaken everybody. So, mm-hmm. and I appreciate you again, Melissa, so much for having me on the show and for the amazing work that you're doing and helping uh, helping awaken the planet as well. So I appreciate you. Oh, I appreciate you and the work you're doing. Your show is just phenomenal. Thank you for watching the Love Cover Life podcast. If you'd like to support this channel, I've shared the link to my Patreon in the description box where you can get benefits like behind the scenes of this podcast, early ad-free access to interviews, and a monthly live stream Q&A with me. 
I've also shared the link to my free Discord community, which I've just started and I'm very excited about, where I share free resources and a bunch of channels and forums where people can connect and grow spiritually together. You'll also find the link to my website, lovecoveredlife.com, where I share my paintings, my TikTok and Instagram at Melissa Denise, and my clips channel, where I share shorter clips of my podcast episodes. Thank you for watching and thank you for your support.